Uh, so, uh, short, a short background, a general uh, summary of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, in Flanders, we have a large number of remote sensing data, as well as uh, uh, historical and recent aerial photographs, a very large collection, also archaeological photographs, uh, mainly by the University of Ghent. Uh, also a lot of World War I historical photographs, World War II historical photographs, uh, which I will refer to along the story, but uh, the main uh, part of my talk will be about two uh, complete LiDAR surveys, surveys so uh, laser altimetric surveys, uh, one from 2004, uh, which had a resolution of one point, one laser scanning point uh, per four square meters, and a recent one from 2014, which is a very much higher resolution, from uh, which has a, a resolution of 16 points per square meter, so that's available for the whole uh, of uh, Flanders. Uh, so my main focus will be on the use of the latest uh, LiDAR survey. In some projects we did before with the, with the earlier data, I will uh, use the, the older data. Or, uh, but for the mapping, I will uh, present mostly uh, examples from uh, the latest uh, uh, LiDAR survey. So I'm going to talk about its uses for site uh, and features detection and landscape modeling. So just to present, uh, to give a view on the, the difference between the, the old LiDAR scan on the left here and the uh, new la uh, laser scan on the right, so a very uh, highly detailed scan, uh, the older data being uh, very much pixel, we were very happy at the time with it, uh, but with the new uh, LiDAR scan uh, we see ma very much more detail and very much more uh, possibilities for uh, landscape mapping. Uh, to give uh, an impression of the, the resolution of this uh, data, this, so this is the total po point cloud for, uh, point for a part of the uh, historic center, center of the, the town of Ghent. Uh, right you see uh, an, a, a color classified image of that point cloud. On the bottom you see a transect through, through it. And to uh, illustrate more the high resolution of this data, uh, you see on the right a 3D uh, uh, plot of the, the point cloud. Uh, of this uh, area, and uh, also again transect. So a very uh, high resolution data set uh, which is available for the whole Flanders, which can be used also for the mapping of uh, historical buildings and uh, historical uh, places and so on. Uh, what we've been doing in the last couple, we have the data set for, uh, for in the end of 2015. Uh, the, the, some, uh, some parts at the, the, uh, in the middle of uh, 2015. So I've been uh, looking for, uh, foremost uh, on the historical forests uh, and grasslands, and we have uh, mapped a lot of new uh, historical and archaeological features. One of these uh, examples is a, a large number of Celtic fields, uh, which uh, pop up in historical forests and parks. I don't know if you can see it, but you can see the, the little square uh, earth banks uh, at the coldest Bos forest in, uh, forest in Limburg. Uh, this is in, in a historical park, where you can see the park structure, of course, but also the, the little uh, bank structures of the Celtic fields. Maybe this is a more clear image of another uh, Celtic field area in 3D. Uh, image. This is also the, uh, the, the, the old LiDAR data, by the way, uh, because uh, for this part, uh, the small part in, in Flanders, the, the new LiDAR data is available. But very uh, new field systems, which were previously unknown, uh, popping up uh, in very uh, large numbers. Uh, so that presents us uh, in this, in this uh, respect uh, a new framework for the research of the proto grant landscape. Right you see an image of the Campine Plateau and the uh, uh, part of the, uh, the northern Campine area and all the, the black dots there uh, is, are areas where uh, new, newly discovered certain fields under historical forests, forests uh, are appearing. And even in intensely uh, surveyed areas uh, where we knew a lot of Iron Age uh, sites were present. Uh, we did know that they were related to uh, Celtic field systems, uh, which are spread out throughout the forest, but you can't see them actually on the ground. You can, if you know, you can sometimes see them uh, in, uh, for example, pathways, but if you stand in the forest, you can't see them with your naked eye. It's just on the lighter uh, skin that it's appearing. So it brings us with a totally new uh, uh, horizontal framework for this cultural landscape. Uh, another example uh, very near those Celtic uh, or part of those Celtic field complexes, uh, also on the forest, on the part on the, on the edge of the Campine Plateau, is also a new site uh, which we didn't know before. 
which is an, uh, a fairly impressive one on the forest here, in this area, and which is uh, probably a hill fort. We don't know in what period. We did a recent excavation of a part of the ditch structure there, but we didn't come up with uh, what well, the clear profile of uh, a ditch structure with no datable material uh, as yet. Uh, so next is going to be a magnetic survey of the, the plateau and uh, other trial trenching. Uh, but that, that's a completely new uh, site um, in the, the hard area of the Celtic field uh, searches. Another example, uh, a newly discovered barrows again, uh, near Postel in the Campine area. Uh, so a number of uh, previously unknown barrows, very well preserved. Uh, some of them transacted by recent ditches. Uh, also aligned with uh, clearly geomorpholo for, for, geomorphological form, namely this land dune. Uh, also under forest, uh, also in the landscape. Some of them are very well visible, some of them very faintly uh, visible. We also did a recent uh, test uh, pit on one of those uh, barrels, which was transacted by the ditch. Uh, and it uh, shows a, a very uh, marked buildup of uh, Bronze Age, Iron Age barrel. And a very well preserved soil underneath it. And again, in the neighborhood of that, uh, that barrow complex, uh, the appearance of Celtic fields, so a complete Iron Age landscape, uh, as it were, preserved under the parts of the, the forest. Uh, again, an example of a, a forested landscape, this time in East Flanders, uh, where we can see, again, a number of barrows, uh, a number of earthworks, uh, an earthen bank here, uh, ancient uh, tracks, uh, so a lot of uh, features popping up in those <coughs> historical forests here as well. A very spectacular example from the Zonian forest uh, near Brussels, uh, which is, uh, well, it believed to be one of the most <coughs> pristine forests of, uh, of, of Belgium and, and, and Flanders. Uh, but what we can see is a very uh, intensely, intensively exploited landscape from the 18th century, with a large number of charcoal kilns. So you can see all those little dots here. Those are all charcoal kilns. Uh, and uh, an entire area, this whole seemingly devastated area, is where they uh, extracted uh, iron ore. So a very intensely, intensively exploited landscape uh, for uh, more recent periods. And uh, we estimate that the number of charcoal kilns, which is dotted throughout the entire Zonian forest, to be more than two, uh, maybe 3,000 uh, of those heaps. <coughs> so, uh, a view on the landscape, uh, for, or on one of those charcoal kilns. So, you can see it fairly clearly uh, with the people standing in it, but again, on the ground, it's much less, if those people wouldn't be standing there, it would be much less visible. Uh, on the ground. Um, another landscape at uh, another forest, Meral Forest near Leuven. Uh, again, forested landscape, uh, also long believed to be uh, deprived of human activity. And what we see there is a completely uh, Roman landscape, uh, an intensively exploited landscape from the Roman period. Uh, because what, what we see here in those dots uh, and uh, we see a number of barrels uh, from older periods, but these dots are all, these circular depressions are loam extraction pits from the Roman period. Uh, we see an, a large number of fossil roads, and we see also a number of Roman erosion gullies pointing towards a very mm. intensively exploited uh, landscape in the Roman period. Um, this is a detailed image from the last day, lighter sets of, of uh, some of those barrels. So you can see, uh, for example, also the, the bank around one of the barrels and maybe even the, the pillage uh, hole uh, sent in the center of one of the other uh, barrows. And uh, this is one of the excavations of uh, transit through, through one of those fossil gullies uh, delivering uh, Roman period ceramics. So uh, pointing towards that they are actually, uh, are very clearly uh, erosion goes, which is also uh, corroborated by uh, Ozel dating. Uh, another for, uh, nice example from the uh, from the middle forest as well. Uh, historical section historical section known as the uh, the Hercules parlor, uh, which is clearly visible on uh, this Ferraris map from the 18th century, uh, and also appears very nicely on the recent uh, DTM data 
uh, and showing that it's also very well preserved, which was uh, not known uh, before shortly. And then one of the, the most enigmatic ones, uh, uh, an, uh, an example uh, from the, uh, uh, the forest near the Postal Abbey, uh, which has nice Abbey beers, cheese, uh, and Flemish stew with Postal beer, so very uh, nice to visit as well, which is located here. But in this uh, yellow square under forest appears this uh, enigmatic structure, so away from all the, the rest of the Postal Abbey, a very Plant laid out a seemingly 17th century garden or park structure, but out of the way of everything else. And uh, last uh, example, but not least, uh, some uh, images from colleagues from Ghent who did uh, a very intensely intensive survey of the World War I heritage, uh, mainly in uh, the west of Flanders, of course, near the front, uh, where they were able uh, to map also a lot of trenches, uh, dugouts, and so on. So a lot of the World War I heritage also popping up on the LIDAR data, uh, which they compared uh, with uh, World War I aerial photographs, which in some cases mapped uh, perfectly. Uh, so going on to from the site level to landscape and site modeling, we did, for example, a project in the uh, late glacial uh, lake of the Moorvaart depression, light of nature development, which was, was one of the compensation areas for the Ghent uh, harbor area. Um, where we can see on the high resolution lighter, uh, lighter and, dunker, uh, and darker colored uh, uh, patches, uh, which refer to lower and higher uh, level areas. We compared that or we did a survey using augerings and uh, geophysical surveying, and uh, based on those combined data sets, we were able to map in very high detail uh, the geomorphological buildup of that part of the lake with, uh, with uh, bridges, with uh, fossil gullies, uh, and so on. Uh, another very short uh, example is uh, for the use of dune morphology. It is also in light of a uh, nature uh, development project uh, at uh, Olsen, the Campine area. And uh, where you can see here is the late glacial dune morphology very clearly uh, po uh, popping up. Uh, the rest is uh, most, most more recent uh, uh, dune morphology, and we can see a very nice relation with the known archaeological sites and the new surveys uh, with, that, with that late glacial uh, rich uh, morphology. Uh, this is a project from 2004, and it was one of the first projects which we used the VTM data uh, on the middle Neolithic causeway enclosure of uh, Ottenburg. In the first place, you see again uh, popping up a number of features like uh, uh, Neolithic wall structures which uh, surround the entire plateau, but also circular depressions which are the same as the depressions I showed before in the middle of forest from the Roman period. Uh, the so-called Tomme, which is our uh, version of Stonehenge, more or less, <laughs> it's a large urban monument from the middle of the Neolithic period. Uh, so a lot of new, well, the tomb was already known, but a lot of new features popping up. But what we did there for the first time was to uh, use erosion modeling of that site uh, using the DTM and using uh, soil maps and so on, and land use maps, and comparing it, for example, with surface art artifact distribution, which gave us a very good impression of uh, the, race, the relationship between those two, but also the current threats uh, from uh, agriculture to this uh, particular monument, which is, which is now a scheduled uh, archaeological monument uh, on the entire plateau. <coughs> uh, another example, uh, also from I think 2008, uh, was the monitoring of the, or the, the uh, evaluation of the preservation condition and erosion rates of the Roman aqueduct artwork of Tongren. Uh, this is the Roman site of the Roman uh, town of Tongeren, which you probably heard or know of. This is the so-called Bökenberg, uh, which is uh, part of the Roman aqueduct, uh, which is under forest, so it's there a very well-preserved monument. But this part of the, uh, the aqueduct is situated in uh, agricultural land. Um, and you can see also on the, uh, on the color photographs that it appears uh, as, a very, as a lighter strip, uh, indicating that their freshly soil is uh, being ploughed up and it's being damaged by uh, agricultural ploughing. <coughs> There's a view on the ridge, so it appears 
on which not very distinct, but you can see it when you uh, move more away from it. What we did there is we, did, we also applied er, uh, water erosion uh, models in the first place, uh, based on DTM, soil maps, and so, ever, and, and so on. Um, we created a tillage erosion map, a uh, combination through uh, digital terrain models, soil maps, uh, and land use maps, which gave us this uh, image. Two minutes. Yeah. And we compared that uh, with, for example, a color classification of the orthophotos uh, appearing with the whiter uh, colored soils, uh, which seemed, which map uh, almost uh, identical, so very uh, <coughs> concordance between the erosion model and the patches of eroding soil on the soil maps, uh, on the uh, on the orthophotos. Um, so this is also now a scheduled moment, and we have a fairly detailed mapping of current erosion patterns and breaks. It still remains not easy to to uh, to manage the site because there are a lot of uh, agricultural uh, farmers involved on in the site. Um, a last example from 2008 was a med med predictive modeling uh, um, <laughs> project with integration of several landscape variables. Uh, so again, reconstruction of watercourse using TTMs, but also historical maps and so on. Uh, a derivative of the um, TTMs, uh, the so-called wetness in index. Uh, slope orientation is just a few examples of a lot of uh, uh, landscape variables being mapped based on uh, foremost DTMs, but also in combination with soil maps and land use maps and so on. It's published in 2008 in the uh, Journal of Archaeological Science. Uh, and we compared that with our archaeological data from uh, the Central Archaeological Inventory, uh, use it to construct uh, through a lot of uh, true Bayesian <coughs> statistics uh, a number of uh, predictive uh, models uh, and testing that and so on. And, uh, uh, fine-tuning that to, towards a uh, predictive model. So those, I just went over a few examples of how we are using those new remote sensing data for most high-resolution LIDAR, which is uh, contributing, contributing vastly to the detection of new sites and the mapping of the geomorpholo geomorphological and cultural landscape. And not only detection, but through combination with other source landscapes uh, analysis and modeling, for example, erosion modeling, but also geomorphological mapping and so on. Uh, and it is very important, of course, not only for research practices, but also very uh, important for uh, management, especially in forested areas where a lot of new sites are popping up. Uh, and the modeling of erosion patterns, for example, uh, effects of tillage uh, practices and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much.